We're out on the streets. Same face, different city. We are in the city of Mendoza. Mendoza, Mendoza, Argentina. And uh, unlike Cordoba, on our first day when we showed up in Cordoba, it was like, I don't know, 92 degrees and really, really humid. Here in Mendoza, it's uh, about 78, high 70s, not humid, nice breeze, very comfortable, good walking weather. So I decided to go for a little walk in the neighborhood where we're staying. And uh, the place I wanted to see was, well, it's right here on this corner here that we're coming up to. Right over here. This plaza is, uh, this is the original founding site of Cordoba. This is where the city was founded. Oh, so. <laughs> Just got run over by that BMW. But did you notice? That BMW stopped for me. He was gonna let me walk by. The pe people are so nice here at Mendoza, geez. Any other city I would've gotten run over. That's not true, I'm just joking. I probably would've gotten run over here in Mendoza too. Maybe that guy was just a, an outlier. Anyway, like I said, this is it. This is the Foundation uh, Plaza. This is the, the place where uh, Mendoza was founded. And now normally, in most cities in Argentina, like for example in Cordoba, when you find the place where the city is founded, uh, there's a bunch of stuff there. There's a church and a bunch of old colonial buildings. I mean, in Cordoba, technically, we found the real first place where it was founded. But, I mean, they moved it, you know, like six years after that or something. Anyway, if you want to see that video, I'll put a link to that one down in the description. But uh, here, there's a bit of a different story in Cordoba for the reason why they uh, there's nothing around here. It's just a... It's a plaza, as you can see. No, uh, no old colonial buildings. No, uh, no big cathedral. None of that. That's because there was a huge earthquake here in uh, 1861, I think. 1861. There was a giant earthquake. I mean, like really, really giant earthquake, um, and it wiped out almost all. The buildings in the city. Almost everything collapsed. The city was basically in ruins. Something like 50 or 60 percent of the population of the city died in the earthquake also. So like it was a major major disaster obviously and uh, so that's one of the reasons why there's nothing around here. When we came into the plaza we walked by um, the remains of an old Jesuit church that collapsed in the earthquake but uh, the you know the remains are still there and uh, it's sort of like an exhibition now. And there's a museum over here too uh, of like, I think like old uh, historical, um, you know, maybe like uh, pieces of buildings and stuff that fell down and like information about the earthquake and about the foundation of the city. So I figured we should go check that out. We'll check that stuff out and see, uh, see what they got going on here. Okay, the museum is open and we're inside. And uh, it looks pretty nice. Immediately when you walk in, there's like glass, glass panels in the floor and you can see like the old excavated, uh, yeah here in the center too, old excavated ruins of the old city um, before the earthquake. That's really cool to see. Reminds me of the uh, Jesuit block, um, you know, the excavated ruins at the Jesuit block that we saw in Cordoba. Um, if you haven't seen that video, I'll put that video link in the description as well. There's a lot of videos from Cordoba. There were, we did a lot of good stuff there. We saw some good stuff. I, I made a whole playlist. You should check it out. But here, there is, uh, yeah, all these old excavated buildings. And, uh, once again, of course, everything in Spanish. That's all right. Such is the way. We are in Argentina, after all. You can't expect things to be in English. When they are in English, it's a nice welcome surprise. But this is a map of the city. And the uh, interesting thing about the city of Mendoza is 
it's pretty small the city itself like it's just this small area right here and it's pretty close to um, like this is where we are by the way right here um, and after the the earthquake they sort of refounded the center of the city over here Plaza Independencia which is this really nice big um, plaza with four little plazas around the corners uh, we'll actually probably do a whole video about that because that's a really cool area um, but the city itself is really small there's a lot of stuff outside of the city so if you look on like a Google Maps or something it the city looks of Mendoza you would think it's like this long uh, vertical north-south sprawling city of you know like a million 1.2 million people but it really isn't the city itself is really just this little part right here and um, that's only about I don't know 200,000 people I think in this in the actual city but like I said the whole area 1.2 million people it's kind of like a mini Buenos Aires in that way you know city of Buenos Aires is like just this um, you know smaller area in the center with like a big urban sprawl around it and uh, the city of Buenos Aires of course like 3 million people and the sprawl is like you know 10 or 12 million people so but that is Mendoza see there's these tall buildings in the city but only a few of them it's after the earthquake they uh, they kind of banned tall buildings um, because you know so many had, so many buildings had collapsed and they were afraid that more uh, more buildings were going to collapse in a future earthquake potentially right but later on when you know building construction um, like technology essentially methods of building construction became stronger and more earthquake proof they sort of allowed taller buildings again so there are a few tall buildings in the city of Mendoza but not too many and the ones that there are are uh, you know like pretty well-known landmarks in the city because there are only a few this looks like a very old map oh yeah 1646 map of the area now interestingly Biblioteca Nacional de Chile so the National Library of Chile Mendoza has a very interesting history and association with Chile Mendoza the city was originally back in the Spanish colonial times part of Chile Chile was like um, all of it was a you know part of the greater Spanish colonies but uh, Mendoza has very close ties to Chile during the colonial eras and uh, there's actually a lot of um, of history of Mendoza I don't know like ind independence movements and movements uh, in Mendoza to like rejoin Chile which is really interesting and kind of spicy and we'll probably make some videos about those too so here are the pre-Spanish the natives who lived here another QR code in case anybody wants to take a closer look so the people who used to live here who uh, were here before the Spanish Huarpe that's the name the name of the uh, the people who used to live here Huarpe and um, a lot of the Huarpe culture and the Huarpe people were sort of like um, intermingled into the Spanish um, like into the, the Spanish communities for um, you know over the over hundreds of years over here looks like some archaeological remains seeds and bones and tools and then here this is Spanish colonial era stuff cast iron pots and wine bottles Mendoza of course famous for its wine one of the great wine cities of the world This is a, like an electric uh, tram line that uh, looks like it was 
built in here in 1885. They have a model of it. Uh, Ferro Carril is um, like the railroad. And electric tram line down here. I don't know if you can see it. So in 1885, they connected the city to uh, the, you know, like to the uh, <clears throat> other other provinces with the train line. All right, so here's a really interesting thing. So Mendoza says atop el bosque urbano, which means like the urban forest. And one thing I have noticed about Mendoza, I've only been here for like one day, but one thing I've noticed is there are trees, like tons of trees along the streets. Um, reminded me a lot of like uh, the Palermo neighborhood in Buenos Aires and also um, Barrio Chino when we went and visited that. Uh, Barrio Chino, by the way, if you want to check out that video, I'll put a link in the description. Um, but the, the trees lining the streets, there are tons of trees in those neighborhoods, in a lot of neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. And that makes sense out there because it rains a ton in Buenos Aires. Um, but out here, it, we're in like the high desert. And if you can see, like, on this photo, I don't know if you can see, but like way out in the background beyond the tree line, it's basically just like scrub desert. It looks a lot like, uh, you know, like the high desert area of California in the United States. And when we were flying in, you could see out the window of the plane, um, it's just like scrubland out there, you know, pretty much as far as you can see in any direction outside of the city. Um, and outside of the farm areas around the city, right? But what's really interesting is there are these water channels all throughout this part of the city. You can see them in green here on this map. Originally, the, um, the natives here had, uh, had a system of channeling water through, um, through uh, like different parts of their settlements to, for agriculture. And the Spanish were very impressed by that and they sort of expanded on it. And you can see them still today. There are these water channels that line all of the streets and they irrigate um, the trees so that you can grow all of these trees here in a city that's like up in the high desert. Here in this section it looks like this is like more modern era stuff. Um, what's interesting is here there's a little this part says if I uh, if I can understand it correctly that basically like when the um, when they the train lines came here in 1885 when they built the train line out, out here to Pedosa and it sort of connected it with the rest of the, the country. Um, it was right around the time when there were a lot of immigrants um, coming to the country. The open immigration policy that brought a lot of uh, German Argentines and Italians and, and different people to, uh, um, to the country. We have several videos about <laughs> the immigration of different groups to the country. And uh, I'm going to put links to all of those in the description. Shameless plugs. But nonetheless, um, a lot of immigrants came and settled here in Mendoza and they were really only able to do that because the train lines were able to connect from you know the port cities out on the Atlantic Buenos Aires and Mar del Plata and places like that out to here and so here you can see like early photographs of of Mendoza and this of course is after the earthquake I mean you can see from these photographs how devastating the earthquake was. I mean, everything, basically just everything as far as you can see, completely collapsed. Here, it looks like this is from before the earthquake, I would imagine. Here's the ruins of the uh, Plaza San Francisco. Actually, I think that may actually be the the church that's like right across.
across the street here that we may go see? I mean, we're going to go see it, but like that may be the church. I'm not sure. If I'm wrong, of course. It won't be the first time. La Cuarta de Fierro. Oh, a place of malevos y criminales. Looks like a very bohemian neighborhood with jazz clubs and dens of sin. People in flapper dresses and fedoras. Sounds cool to me, actually, to be honest. Old beer bottles and liquor bottles. Some old money. Again, the uh, can't stress enough the devastation that the earthquake caused. I mean, it really, really devastated the entire city. Here's a map from I don't know when. There's no... I don't see a card or anything saying what this map is or where it's, like, when it's from, but let's see if we can figure this out. Okay, so here's Plaza Independencia. That's uh, where I said the you know when they moved the uh, the you know, new center of the city, the one main plaza with the four smaller plazas around it. You can see right in the center, Plaza Independencia, and then up in the corner there, Plaza de Lima, which is uh, now uh, let's see, Plaza Lima I think is now Plaza. Chile, and then Plaza Montevideo, which I think now is called Plaza Italia, Plaza, I don't know what that says, Plaza Cobo, anyway, I think that's Plaza España, and Plaza San Martín, which is still Plaza San Martín, I hope I'm right about that, those four, I mean, I know I'm right about the four names, those are the four names of them, but I don't know if, uh, if I got, uh, you know, the names right for each one when I was looking at them. What is this? Agua Nupcial? Wedding water? Publications and uh, diaries? Uh, what is this? Looks like looks like medical products, old uh, elixirs and tonics. How much of this stuff you want to bet had like cocaine and heroin in it? Section on education. Little ink wells, school bag. Oh, there's a desk. Tiny, tiny little desk. More excavated, uh, the excavated ruins. I guess it's not really excavated, they just preserved it. It's preserved from, uh, after the earthquake, you know, everything here collapsed. You can see the, the foundations of the walls, but, I mean, they just, it was all collapsed. And they built this museum around it, which is uh, pretty neat. I mean, it's too bad that there had to be a massive earthquake that, like, wiped out the entire city and killed, like, 60% of the population in order them to build this museum, but, you know, it is what it is. Oh, and over here, this is on the other side of where we came in. There's the front door over there. Looks like this is 
like some drawings of the, uh, the old buildings that were here in the square. So that's what the, like, the plaza, the buildings in the plaza looked like. Some old, old floor plan. Actually, pretty cool. I don't think these are actually old um, drawings. These look like they're from 2002, so they're like recreations of what it, you know, what it looked like back then. But uh, it is interesting to see see what was here before the earthquake. This looks like a model, a model of what the square looked like. There's the church, of course, over there. As we know, when the Spanish show up, they build a church. Oh, looks like there's another church. The Spanish showed up here and built two churches. That makes sense. Oh, and here you can see, like, a canal running through. And this is what I mentioned. There were these irrigation canals running through old parts of the city, too and you can still see them. What have we been looking at here? This is all about archaeology. I guess this is like the archaeology that they've been a project, archaeological project digging up dead people and and all those uh, things that we saw in those glass cases over there. Tools and arrowheads and stuff like that. Oh, and here they have, <laughs> they have a little hands-on exhibit where you can, you can come and, come and brush away, <laughs> brush away the sand and, and there's like a rib cage under it. We'll put that back on there for whoever comes here next. Let them have some fun too, brushing away the sand. <sighs> it's pretty cool. Museums are cool, but it's always nice when a museum has a little bit of a hands-on uh, thing, you know, for the kids. For the kids and for me. I'm basically a big kid. Oh, here's the original. This is the original map of uh, Mendoza, the Spanish colonial map with the center plaza right there and all the blocks around it. You can see how similar this map looks to like the map of Cordoba. When they came and draw, drew out how they were, you know, planning how they were going to map out a new city, they basically just did it the same way everywhere they went. They did the same thing in Buenos Aires too. Um, Plaza de Mayo is like the, the more or less the center of the city, or it was the center of the colonial city. So I just slapped down a center square right in the middle, put a church in it, plaza, you know, do five blocks out in each direction, make a big square, and there you go, you got a city. And then, of course, unfortunately, you get a bunch of slaves to build it for you. Ah, this is really cool. Old, uh, Spanish colonial, looks like, uh, like the window of a Spanish colonial home and what would be inside. Yep, there's the aforementioned slaves who built it all. Hmm, oh, some old like porcelain pieces back in the colonial era. Fragments of old colonial stuff. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, a lot of times in a lot of cities around here, because there's no earthquake, they find fragments of things, they're much older, and the colonial things are, you know, still preserved. Like, I mean, 
the house of Rafael de So Romante, the whole thing. It's just there. And it's full of all these, like, you know, porcelain vases and sculptures and all kinds of stuff because no earthquake. But here, you know, you dig down into the soil and you find all kinds of stuff, not just, like, stuff from pre-colonial, but you find, you know, colonial stuff, porcelain pieces from the 16, 1700s that, uh, that ended up buried after the earthquake. This is El Capitan Pedro de Castillo. 2nd of March, 1561. Founded the city. There he is right there. Or a uh, rendition of him. Here's a rendition of, I guess, the natives that he found here. Well, we've taken a long walk around. Uh, oh, see? An entire skeleton. I'm not the only person who wants to use those brushes and reveal that skeleton. I think that's about it. We've seen, oh, well, actually, looks like there's another section over here that we missed when we went around. This is the last one. Let's go check it out and see what's in here. So it looks like this is actually detailing a number of floods that they've had here in the city. 1622, 1959, 1970, and it looks like, you know, they show like a, an example of a bunch of stuff that would have clogged up one of those water channels. And you can see pictures. 19, uh, what is this, 1970? Yeah. With parts of the road collapsed because of floods, because the water channels were clogged. I guess that's why they do such a good job of keeping the garbage out of them these days. But one of the things about um, desert, high desert areas is it doesn't rain often, but when it does rain, um, you can get flash floods, really, really um, intense and severe flash floods, which is, I imagine, why the water channels were built in the first place, not only to be able to irrigate all the trees in the city, but also to prevent flash floods and channel water. It's interesting, we, uh, we saw the same thing out in Cordoba, La Cañada, the stream that channels all the water um, through the city and that big canal ends up in the uh, Primero River and they had to build that because of a number of floods over the centuries. Link to that video in the description. Yeah. And this is... They use the water channel it for agriculture. You know, because of the irrigation and the, the way that the water has been channeled and, um, you know, it really, it maximizes the amount of water that they get here. And there's not really enough water um, or rainfall to support the size of population that lives here and that has lived here over the centuries without that kind of, um, you know, water management. It's really ingenious when you think about it. Be able to channel water to specific places where it's needed so that you can support a population that's, you know, larger than what you really should be able to support based on the rainfall. If you're from Los Angeles <laughs> in the United States, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because y'all have like three million more people than you should based on your rainfall. This looks like a uh, reproduction of uh, like a raft of some sort. This is definitely a, a old uh, the Huarpa people. This is uh, something that they would have made. And I imagine to float things, you know, down the river. Oh yeah, see there, that's what it was. Let me get out of the way. So there's no, not too much of a glare, but that's what it was. So you can get down the river. Stand on one of those things, get a big stick, and commute to work.
Ah, and here. This is the beautiful natural wonder of the province of Mendoza. I mean, <laughs> come on, look at this. I mentioned this in a in a video before. I don't remember which one, but man, uh, Argentina is just such a beautiful country. The natural beauty in Argentina is really amazing. I think that's it. That was a very cool museum. Honestly, I wasn't I didn't know what to expect when we came over here. Literally just uh was in a cafe this morning getting coffee and dos media lunas like like we like we do. I was on my phone doing some crash research into the history of of uh, Mendoza and I saw that this plaza was right over here saw that there was a museum figured what do we do on this channel we go find plazas and old stuff and poke around and go to museums and do stuff like that but uh, yeah, that was pretty cool I'm glad we went and it was a nice walk and uh, now the sun's coming out out here nice and warm with a cool breeze and I'm it's not my first day, but I'm really liking this city. I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. Anyway, we'll go over to this church over here. Kind of running a little low on battery on the camera, but we'll film as much as we can. And I don't know. Let's. I'm, I'm really interested to see it because you know it's, it's all we saw pictures of all these old you know collapsed ruins from the post earthquake, and there right across the street there is some right here. There it is. I'm sticking the camera through these uh, this fence to see. It looks like... Oh, you know what? <laughs> I just saw some people walking through a gate over there, so it looks like we can go in. There's a plaque here that I can't read because it's all worn off. It's in Spanish. We'd only be able to read like 50% of it anyway. <laughs> sticking my camera through the bars. Then you look over and there's a whole group of people just like walking through a gate. It's like those videos of like a dog behind the fence barking like crazy at someone and the gate next to him is just wide open. So. Oh here, this is uh, these are the water channels I was talking about. They're all over the city. See? They run right alongside the road and uh, they got all these trees next to them. See? So they can keep these trees lining the entire thing and then they've got, you know, of course, places where you can step across so you can catch the bus and not fall into the thing very cool and these are like I said throughout the, um, a major part of the of the city very cool very ingenious all right well here we go we're heading in wow ruinas jesuiticas De San Francisco. It looks like we're, we're getting an actual little tour here. And uh, I think it's going to be in Spanish, so... Okay, we got a little tour. I didn't film all of it. We're running low on battery. But I understood like 80% of it. And when I said that I understood 80% of it, the people on the tour actually clapped for me and I felt pretty proud. But anyway, I'll go over what I understood and what I can remember. And basically, what it was, was... Originally... The Jesuits, they built like an adobe, um, uh, like a church here. And the remains of that are no longer, like they're just not here. But later they built this large brick structure over here. Started right here in this area. And, the, you know, they built this, uh, this structure, minus of course all these like wrought iron, you know, these iron I-beams. This was all much, much later. But they built it here, and on the other side of this wall, in front of us, there was a there was a monastery, a monastery on the other side of this wall. So there was a temple on this side, a monastery on the other side, and there are passages that go in between, like this one over here, in between the temple and the monastery. And now, when the Jesuits were expelled, from all of the um, Spanish colonies in 1767, this was actually taken over by Franciscans. So it's a different religious order, Catholic religious order that took over, and they uh, used this as their temple. So that's why it's called the, the uh, um, 
ru ruinas, ruins of Jesuitica de San Francisco, right? So this, the Franciscans took it over. And after the earthquake in 1861, when this was all, when this all collapsed, these ruins were uh, later declared like an archaeological uh, or, an, you know, like a historical site. And in 1970, uh, they started to put up these concrete bases that you can see all around the brick areas in order to preserve them and keep them from falling down. They put up this concrete cross that you can see right here. Well, it's kind of hard to see because there's a the metal in the way, but there's a, a cross made of concrete. And they put that up to remember the victims of the earthquake. And then in like the 2000s, in the early 2000s, they put up all of these uh, I-beams that you see. And the I-beams are not just to like, you know, to keep it structurally up, but they sort of um, show you where, um, like where the buildings used to be. And if you can see um, the arch up there, this one actually shows how tall the arches were. And you can see how tall it was because this arch here, you, this is um, like this is how tall the arch is now, but it's because a lot of this has been buried by sediment from the earthquake. So the arches itself of this building were actually that tall that you can see in that uh, iron piece. But this is how tall they are now. And if we go over here, pass through from the temple area into the monastery, this area here was all the monastery. And you can, they've added on these iron pieces here to sort of simulate what uh, the halls of the monastery used to be like. So this would all have been indoors walking through the halls. So it's pretty cool. At first, when I came over here, I thought that those uh, those iron structures were really just to, like, you know, maintain structural integrity so this thing doesn't fall down. But they serve a, actually a much cooler purpose to sort of show what the, the temple and the monastery looked like before the earthquake brought it all down. So, very cool. Like I said, uh, there may have been some stuff that I maybe misunderstood during the tour, but I understood a good amount of it. And... Uh, feel pretty happy about that because most of the time we don't understand shit but I, I think she was being nice for me because at the beginning of the tour she asked me where I was from and I said I was from the United States and I didn't speak very good Spanish so I think she spoke kind of slowly uh, she used her hands a lot to like gesture things so that always helps I mean I, I gotta be honest you know like there's always a thing when you, you uh, I don't know. I, I noticed this uh, in the United States. It's always a thing when, like, someone doesn't speak English, for example, and people find out they don't speak English, and then they just like speak in English still, you know, louder and slower. And you'll get some people who say like, "Oh, well, you know, they don't speak English. Well, they don't speak loud, slow English too." But that's the thing. Sometimes people say they don't speak English, but they actually speak English, or they understand a good amount of it. But they're just, you know, like maybe embarrassed about how their level of English, like I am embarrassed about my level of Spanish. And for those kinds of people, if you speak slowly and loudly and like enunciate, it is much easier for them to understand. And I know this because when people are willing to speak like slowly and enunciate uh, in Spanish, I can understand like 70 or 80 percent and I can get enough to understand pretty much exactly what they're saying. The problem is when people are just speaking at, you know, full, full speed, full speed, and then, then I don't understand anything. Anyway, that was pretty cool. I think we've seen what we can see. My battery's about to die on this camera. And uh, for our first day in Mendoza, I think we saw some pretty cool stuff. So uh, stick around. We have lots more videos from Mendoza. It's a very, very interesting uh, city and province. There's a lot of history here. There's a lot of cool stuff to see. And we're going to try and see a bunch of it. So uh, for now, hope you enjoyed the video and uh, tune in for the next one.